In this week's episode of Critical Role, we meet FCG's nemesis, an infamous NPC, and we finally get some answers about the moon. Hi everyone, my name's Luna, and strap in because this was a lore-heavy episode. We are gonna get into it. There's no Talison this week as he was off sick, so Matt had Ashton kind of sneak away from the group, off doing something else, and is going to catch up with them later. While we may have gotten some answers about Ruidus, we came away with nothing but questions about Head. This bird-like creature, as Matt calls it, swoops down, pooping all over FCG's head. Imogen casts Inflict Wounds on it, and Fern casts Ice Knife, knocking it out of the air. Fern thinks she has killed it, but FCG is not so sure. They want answers, so they cast Spare the Dying, so they can have a bit of time to think about whether they want to heal this creature, so as to get some answers, but before they even have a chance of healing it. Heal it? It could haunt me forever. One of the wings, like, snaps back back into place. Oh. And one of its talons kind of picks up and its head kind of like. You see, you see, oh. you see. They hold the creature down and FCG asks, what do you want from me? Why do you keep following me? I don't know, there's just something about you I have to ruin. <laughs> <laughs> do you know my past? Do, do you know, are you? I know everything about you. No, I don't know anything. I just <laughs> I just don't like the way you look. What? You're not penance for my Sure, whatever you want me to be. You're just a good talker. Well, how can I get you to leave me alone? You can't. If I'm here forever, I'm making myself everyone else's problem. This line that the bird says, if I'm here forever, I'm going to make myself everyone else's problem, that was really interesting to me. We know from Chetney's ability that this creature is undead, so that would explain why they're around forever. But the way it was worded, it made it sound like this bird has got some grudges. Who else is he being a problem for? And why is he being a problem in particular for FCG? The fact that it tracked FCG across a continent makes me feel like there has got to be something more than just a haha, I'm an undead bird that likes to poo on shiny things. And is it actually a bird? Is it an undead Aarakocra? What, what is it? <laughs> This was just not really the encounter that I was expecting. So yeah, I'm curious to hear your opinion on it as well. The creature manages to escape from Chetney's grip and flies away. Laudner sends Pate after it to follow it, but unfortunately Pate can't keep up. FCG believes that the bird creature is punishing them for sins of their past, but Fern has a novel idea for dealing with it. What if, what if you accept it and sort of make a space for him, accept the nest on your head? What? <laughs> you know, like like if he's been th thinking that your wires were a nest, maybe you just like set up a little bed for him. Oh, I can't wait for all the the FCG fan art with just like a little a little nest on their head. The big question is, when are we gonna see Shithead again? Okay, back to the quest. <laughs> they enter the Adolin Seminary and they go up to the sort of reception desk, the info desk. Aram informs the clerk that they are looking for Ebenold Kai. If you will recall, Astani Ro in the Hartmore Hamlet gave Aram a letter of introduction to give to Ebenold Kai. They ask the clerk where they can find him, but... Unfortunately, he's uh, canceled his classes. Um... A couple of months ago, and hasn't been seen in the seminary for some time. Mm. I believe he's either been on holiday or he's restructuring his curriculum, I believe is the going assumption. They also inquire about Professor Khadija Sumal, who is the one who headed up the study that Imogen's mother was a part of. She is still working on the campus. She will be in tomorrow. It's at this point that a very strange figure with a very commanding presence walks in. You see what looks to be this is being vaguely human, uh, somewhat messy red hair and pale skin. Uh, they're wearing an elaborate, loose, sleeveless vestments that drape around them, like long robes with strips of uh, kind of gold-embossed material, uh, sleeveless, revealing these massive hammer-like muscular arms that are covered in intricate tattoos and adorned in platinum bracers that have all manner of glyphs carved across them that devour about half of the forearm. Yeah. Uh, their face is covered in a bronze mask, like a dark bronze that lacks eyes or features. Instead, you see a patterned array of fine script and symbols across it. These people? 
things are super creepy. They have these metal masks that have no eye holes in them or anything, so they can't see out of them. They must rely on other senses, and they also apparently don't speak. They just hulk around, looking scary. With a natural 20 history check, Fern knows that these creatures are called Judicators. They are guardians and hunters of the high temples of Vasselheim. The ranks of Judicators are made up of divine warriors and soldiers who volunteered to undergo this process, this transformation perhaps, of a series of challenging rituals and blessings to become exalted soldiers. Basically, super paladins, but creepy ones. <laughs> This sect began during the Wars of the Calamity, which is the 200 year or so long war between the Prime Deities and the Betrayer Gods. They are considered weapons for the Prime Deities, but they mainly act as bodyguards and protectors for the High Clerics and such of Vasselheim, as well as protectors of their trove of ancient artifacts and relics. They kind of remind me of the Mountain in Game of Thrones, like that kind of creepy, not really a person anymore situation. I wonder if behind the mask is a human or if it's something that's not really human anymore. Chetney notices that all of their armor and such is covered in abjuration glyphs and abjuration is the uh, magic of protection. So I have a feeling that if they get into a fight with these things, which seems like they're gonna, they're gonna be pretty hard to hit. Imogen telepathically communicates with the clerk who we learn her name is Karel, and she learns, yes, that these Judicators are from Vasselheim. They've been here for about a week and nobody, at least among her ranks, knows why they're here. They've just been given free reign of the seminary by the headmaster. Okay, so let's do a quick rundown on Vasselheim for those who are not familiar with that city. Vasselheim is the capital city of Isilra, which is a third continent on Exandria. It's a continent that we don't know a huge amount about because we haven't had a campaign set there. Vox Machina did visit Vasselheim Vasselheim in campaign one, but they really mainly stayed within the city. Personally, I'm betting that campaign four is going to take place on Isilra. Vasselheim is the oldest city in Exandria. It's believed to be the first city, and it's the only city that survived the calamity. It is a deeply religious city, so much so that arcane magic is frowned upon, and in fact, you can get in trouble with the law if you're using arcane magic. This distrust of mages and arcane magic dates all the way back to the fallout of the Age of Arcanum, a time of huge arcane magical development, which is explored in EXU Calamity. We learned from Astani earlier in the campaign that the Grim Verity had managed to obtain certain texts from Vasselheim that contained world-shaking knowledge about two other gods that used to exist at the time of the founding that are no longer a part of the Pantheon. So the group draw the conclusion that these Judicators from Vasselheim are here searching for those texts, a conclusion that is confirmed later in the episode. Back to Karel, FCG asks her about mechanical and engineering studies at the university. However, at this point, she is done answering questions because they have been asking a lot of very pointed, uh, very specific questions that have absolutely nothing to do with enrolling at the seminary. So she's like, no, I'm, I'm not going to tell you anything else. But, you know, FCG is not going to let something like that stop them. My apologies. We're, we're, <laughs> we're not friends, but we could be, and I'll cast fast friends on them. Yeah. Oh, yes, let's <laughs> go. Getting dirty with it. Karel fails her save, and she tells them that they need to speak with Professor Isham, who is the head of the Automaton Studies and Development, and gives directions to their office. But not only that, she says that she will take them directly to Evanold Kai's house. So helpful until the party realized that the downside to that spell is as soon as it wears off, the target knows that they were charmed. They decide the best course of action is to try and be really nice to her so that when that happens, she will like them properly. Okay. Let's, let's like ask her like what her favorite baked goods are and her favorite color so and her favorite, her favorite flowers. Yeah. So we can like, you know, <gasps> Carol. Yes? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, what are some of your favorite things in life? Carell reveals that she cleans up and resells items and trinkets and things that, that she finds. And she lets slip that she stole something from the university and sold it on. I thought that this was a very clever bone to throw to the party because inevitably she is going to be angry and upset when the spell wears off. And this way they have something to hold over her, something to blackmail her with essentially to keep her silence. It's at the end of an hour. So I just want you to remember, Carol, that we've exchanged so many words with each each other today. Very Please well. remember them. Very masterfully done, Matthew Mercer. I mean, given events later in the episode, they might still get kicked out of the seminary. Doesn't look like they're necessarily in the good graces, but we'll get to that. 
Honestly, I love Carol. I hope she gets enough money for that boat and she meets a nice sailor one day. I thought she was awesome. They arrive at Evan Old Kai's house, which looks a little neglected and a little overgrown. Chetney picks the lock to the gate and then sees that the front door is locked and it's also apparently trapped. There is a cable running sort of inside the house. Imogen makes Aram invisible so he can help and they scurry up to the second floor where they find that the windows there are all locked as well and there is a silver wire running underneath the window frame. So Chetney crawls down a chimney and ends up in a bedroom, noticing again that silvery wire around the room. I have a very strong suspicion that this wire is for the alarm spell, which allows you to place it somewhere and then it will give you like a mental alarm whenever somebody crosses it. Chetney gives a good sniff and can smell nerves and sweat as if somebody was here very recently and was afraid. He creeps downstairs and calls out. Professor Kai? We don't mean any harm, we just want to talk. No offense, but I can smell you. He attempts to disable the trap behind the front door so that the others can come in, but he accidentally sets it off, releasing this black tar across the floor. So instead he opens a window and the others come in through that way. Imogen casts Detect Thoughts to try and sense where this person or persons might be, and senses two mines beneath them. The party split up to investigate the house and Lorna and FCG find a secret door hidden behind a painting of a sailboat and opening it, they find some stairs and head down with Aram in the lead. Just as they're coming to the bottom of the stairs. I heard something. Oh, no. And something, and you watch as a skull gets like tossed from far back in the chamber. It hits the ground and rolls kind of in front of both of you before it stops to look up at you, its jaw open, and its eyes shh, brightly flash an incredibly white, searing light. Both of you need to make constitution saving throws oh, for me. Oh, Aram fails his save, which means he is blinded and frightened and is not able to go into the room. However, he does hurriedly call out and say who they're there looking for and, and who they were sent by. There are two figures down here, a half-elven woman and an older halfling man. He says that he is Ebon Old Kai. And then a lot of stuff happens all at once. The woman finishes reading, the scroll burns, and you can see Suddenly, this dark corner of the room, as you all bring your own light in, the far corner begins to alight in its own right. What you can see now is a large circle, about a 10 foot by 10 foot circle on the ground of various glyphs and symbols <laughs> begins to brighten up. I think I teleport. And as it does, you can see the uh, the woman goes, now! No, 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 runs into the circle, she I get vanishes. Into. You go running in as well? Yes! Ebon Old goes, ah! And he runs into it and vanishes. I, I go to. All right, this is. We got six seconds, right? We got six seconds for everyone to follow behind. Are Let's you all rushing go. in? Yeah. No. Yeah. No, I'm not going that way. I'm not going that way. I'm not going that way. Anyway. I just yank him. Oh, make it, make a contested oh, strength check. Come on. Jesus Fuck. Christ. But I'm no. I'm also super weak. So. Yeah, so it's contested. Come on. No, I rolled a six. Okay. I rolled okay. a three, okay. oh. for, so it's a three. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Okay, okay, okay. Team Tiddlywinks over here. Uh, in the brief minutes, as, as, as the rest of your team is vanishing, just, just praying and diving into whatever this strange ritualed circle is in the middle of the room as its energy begins to slowly fade before it closes, you begin just screaming as they drag you over the skull and you run towards the back end of this room before you rush into the circle just as the final throws of its magical instrument begin to fade, vanishing in a flash of light. That's where we're gonna go to break. Oh! If you're looking for somewhere to chat about the latest theories and your predictions for the episode, every week over on Twitch, I hold a pre-critical role hype party where I go live a couple of hours before the episode airs on Twitch and we talk about the most recent episode as well as our theories and predictions for the upcoming episode. We often do a lot of like silly games as well. Like we just started playing uh, the Critical Role Mad Libs book and I do quizzes and things like that. It's a really fun time to hang out with other critters and to really get into the the nitty gritty of everybody's favorite conspiracy 
conspiracy theories. So make sure you're following me on Twitch so that you can join in. It's twitch.tv forward slash Luboffin. Bell's Hells emerge into a dark cavern of volcanic rock. There are lanterns hanging from the ceiling. The air is hot and stuffy and there's like a sulfur smell. And there is also these flows of molten rock throughout the space. There is some furniture around the room and as Matt is describing this to the players, they realize that they have seen this place before. Arrive in a shaded cavern lit by numerous nebulous sources of firelight. Dancing about, you see a tall, rocky ceiling that reaches above you, porous in black as a number of chain lanterns hang to cast some additional light within the inside. The air smells of sulfur and charcoal, and it is uncomfortably hot in here. You immediately break into a sweat. As your eyes begin to adjust to the darkness in here, with the bits of pinpoint light, you can see some of that glow in here, some of the source, is instead of just being a small fire or a lantern, there is a pouring river of molten rock that is slowly snaking its way through the chamber. Snaking its way. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, this place is on the elemental plane of fire, and the Mighty Nine visited it very briefly in episode 129 as they were attempting to flee from the Dwendalian Empire's forces. They got there because they had been given a plane shift scroll spell by Yusa, just as the half-elven woman used a scroll to get here as well. Okay, so this is when we start to get so much lore, and it was all talked about sort of out of order and with different people, so I I have split this next part of the video into sections so that we can hopefully all keep it straight in our heads. There are three people in this cavern, apart from Bell's Hells, and Aram hands over the letter from Astani to Evanold Kai. After he reads it and realizes that, you know, they're good guys, we get some introductions. So Ebenold Kai is a founder of the Omen Archive at the seminary and has done a lot of studies on Ruidus and Ruidus born and was involved in that study with Professor Khadija Sumal. Dr. Baron Vestisho is the half-elven woman. Puts it down, you can now see she has these uh, kind of thick bottle, like, you know, bottles glasses on the front of her face with this like silver elven, elven scrolling tattoos around the eyes. Um, this like slacks and green blouse. She is from Orthansia in Isora, and she is a specialist in the founding, which is the time when the deities arrived at Exandria and began to create it, to, to, to make it what it is and imbue it with life. As well as the schism, which is when the gods separated into two factions, the prime deities and the betrayer gods. The third person is Plain Rider Rin, a tiefling planeswalker, or it's called Plain Rider in this setting. A female tiefling. <sighs> Looks to be an older 50s, um, like a deep, deep ruby red skin color with this kind of like white, almost sky blue piercing eyes with just a single black pupil dot in each. These uh, horns that curl back and up and almost like these two large pointed horns about that size to the back of the head and it's very, very short black hair that's cut just to the base of the skull with these like gray streaks that kind of comb down in two parts. She stands there in like uh, what looks to be a combination of robes and some leather armor, um, and is just holding a particularly crooked looking wand in your direction. Indeed, you have come to my abode. Rin is a member of the Arcana Pansophical, a collection of very powerful arcane practitioners and mages who work to prevent the misuse of magic. Allura Vaisuran, another very well-known NPC, is also a member. Rin studies astronomy and the planes and the way that those things interact and shift and align, and she spends a lot of her time traveling between the planes. Rin got involved with the Grim Verity because she has been doing a lot of work on astronomical phenomena and the connections between the planes, and she noticed uh, some inconsistencies with the way things were moving and aligning and that these inconsistencies coincided with flares from Ruidus. She also learned of the Shadowfell and the Feywild building their own constructions and 
and we know that the Nightmare King was involved in those as well as the one that Homdir was built. However, that is news to Ren. She didn't seem to know that the Nightmare King was involved. So it basically does seem like this network is of the Grim Verity is fractured somewhat and information is not necessarily being passed around that easily, which makes a lot of sense if you're in hiding from super creepy, righteous paladin robot things. Once the introductions are done, Ebenold asks the group, why are you all involved in this? And Imogen explains about herself being Ruidus born, about her connection to Ruidus and her very powerful powers, which leads Ebenold to ask if she is an exultant. Dr. Baron kind of steps forward. In our research, we, um, there have been certain Ruidus born who uh, exhibit a particularly strong connection uh, to the, the entity in the sky um, and begin to uh, Well, as you describe, uh, exhibit certain uh, capabilities, if I believe so. This is a bit beyond my personal purview. Imogen certainly does seem to fit the description of these people, these exultants. Imogen asks if they knew her mother, Liliana, and Ebenold recognizes her as being Liliana's daughter. Ebenold explains that Liliana volunteered for the study because she was seeking answers about, you know, what was happening to her and what all of these dreams meant. But she grew frustrated with a lack of answers, and so she left to seek answers herself. And that is what seems to have lent her or led her towards Odahan Thul and joining forces with her. We also learn from Ebenol that Odahan used to be a pious warrior of the Dusk Maven, the Raven Queen, but she no longer worships her. Potentially, she now worships this figure, Predathos, which we will get to in a bit. Odahan is also an exultant and appears to be gathering other Ruidus born to her to build. An army? She's been gathering these Ruidus born in a site in the Hillcatch Valley, which we will also get to. So why is Imogen's mum there? One possibility that the party floats, or I think Imogen specifically floats, is maybe she is trapped there. Maybe she did go to Odahan seeking answers and then she got in too deep and she couldn't get out. And that is why she is pushing Imogen away. That would sort of explain that impulse to keep Imogen away. Because, you know, if she was like totally gung-ho on Odahan's side, you think she would be telling Imogen like, yeah, come and join us. It's great. But the fact that she wants to keep her away does make me believe that she is trapped there and is probably looking for a way out or doesn't believe that there is an out, that she's gone too far. The Judicators are in Eos looking for Baron because of some texts that she and two others stole from Vasselheim. These are the texts that I was talking about earlier that we heard about from Astani Roe with the world-shaking information about extra gods in the Pantheon. Baron and two others, Arnold, Drolt, and Janina, learned of these texts during the course of their studies, but found they were not able to access them with the higher-ups of Vasselheim just completely disavowing their existence altogether. They managed to steal these texts, but Arnold was captured and Janina is currently seeking information about that site in the Hellcatch Valley. So in the interim, Baron has been hiding out with Ebenold and they have been trying to uh, connect with other members of the Grim Verity, teleporting around, trying to share as much knowledge as possible, but also staying in hiding. I love this little meta comment from Plain Rider Rin about teleporting them around. One wonderful thing about magic is eventually you become everyone's transportation device. Ah, uh, poor Essek. <laughs> in Baron's opinions, the higher-ups at Vasselheim are in such a tizzy about these texts because they fear what will happen if the followers of these faiths learn that their gods are fallible, and not only that, they have been lied to about the nature of the divine to begin with. Imogen asks if these texts mentioned anything about a city, but they did not, so Imogen shares the information they have about seeing a city on the moon including the divine lattice that encased it. Plain Rider Rin doesn't seem perturbed by this information at all. In fact, she seems delighted. Okay, okay, all right. This is, I'm, I'm pleased that we didn't find ourselves completely uh, impeded by dollars. This is delightful. All right. Oh. And then we learn what these texts actually said. No more dancing about, just cold hard facts. There were two other gods during the founding. Ethodoc, the endless shadow, the god of darkness and winter, and Vordo, the fate shaper, uh, the god of fate and order. The texts speak of another entity that arrived to Exandria, an entity that they called Predathos. Predathos resisted their miracles and hunted them. Oh, oh fuck, oh fuck. Spawning its own 
twisted life in its wake as it did. Radathos hunted the gods and devoured Ethodoc and Vordo. The gods, understandably, were terrified, and so they built a prison for Pradathos from Exandria itself, carving out a portion of it, and then that uh, crystallized or formed into Rudis, and it sort of now is tethered to Exandria in that way. Now, as world-shattering as this information is, it's not actually wholly new knowledge. As we have discussed here in the past, the book Coal of the Netherdeep discusses how an alien influence arrived to Exandria and the gods feared its influence, so they locked it away and this being crystallized into Ruidus. My thing with that theory always was that it is written in the Call of the Netherdeep, at least the way that I read it. It still felt very much like mythology, like this is the the mythology of the world, but not necessarily what actually happened. I think that's kind of the tricky thing with fantasy settings is that a lot of time there is a mythology in the same way that our world has mythology of like the, you know, uh, an egg cracked in the sky and the dragons came out of it and then the dragons devoured the egg. But when you're dealing with actual divine beings in a, in a fantasy setting, how much of that is just the mythology of the world, the things that people tell each other about the gods, and how much of it is actually what happened with the gods? Does that make sense? I feel like I didn't explain myself very well. But either way, it's really great to have this solidly confirmed about what Ruidus is. It's canon, baby. Confirming that, yes, Ruidus is trapping a god or a godlike creature, and it is a prison. Not only does Prodathos consume gods, it also spawns life in its wake, twisted life. And this could explain the presence of the city, that it has somehow spawned this group of scary mutant moon people who are living on the moon. The Grim Verity believe Prodathos is using Ruidus born as anchors to Exandria. I think Odahan gathering all of these Ruidus born in a single place is so that that energy can be focused or those anchors can be used to release Prodathos. Um, Predathos. They want to see it unleashed and devouring the gods. But that's an interesting point. If it is unleashed, can it even get to the gods? Because the gods are locked away behind the divine gate. So what will it do then? Will it just devour the world? I don't know. Let me know your theories. Now we're going to talk about how the Cerberus Assembly, which is a powerful group of mages from Wildmount, are involved in all of this. The site in the Hellcatch Valley, which is where Odahan is assembling Ruidisborn, was an excavation site that was controlled by the Adolin Seminary for a number of years. But recently, the Cerberus Assembly, through some like political wheeling and dealing and some political strong arming, have managed to commandeer it and are in control of it. This site is believed to have been built a long time ago for focusing the energy of a solstice, like centuries ago. And this focus point for Solstice energy was believed to have been created by a group of people called the Tishtan, a nomadic magic obsessed society that traveled across Exandria building monuments during the schism. They disappeared with no record of how or why. So not only is the assembly in control of this focus site, they are also heavily involved in the construction of these devices in the Shadowfell and the Feywild, as we've learned in previous episodes. So my big question is, is what is the Cerberus Assembly hoping to gain out of all of this? What are they going to get out of it? Surely a god devouring being being released is bad for everyone, right? Including the Cerberus Assembly. There must be some kind of power that they are hoping to control or some kind of technology that they're hoping to get their hands on. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm just... Yeah, I'm so curious to know what their actual stake in it is other than just like scary power good. Aram asks the members of the Grim Verity what they intend to do about all of this and Baron and Eben are just like, I don't know, we're just scientists, man. We just, we don't know what to do. But Plain Rider Rin, on the other hand. I, I'm a doer. I make things happen. I make things get weird. <laughs> So, with their knowledge, their trust, some friends, I think we want to make things weird for these people. Bell's Hells then discuss what they can do, what their part in this whole 
thing can be and they outline a couple of options. Option one or perhaps a future option is to somehow infiltrate the Nexus site and try and investigate what's going on, potentially using Liliana as an in. Or they can investigate these machines that are being constructed in the Feywild and the Shadowfell. Rin suggests that they specifically focus on the Shadowfell because she believes that the Cerberus assembly, their operation there is like not as airtight as some of their other operations and it would be easier to infiltrate. Another option they have is asking Fern's grandmother Morrigan for help because she's in the Feywild and it seems like she's a powerful Archfey and she might specifically be able to help them with the problem of time in the Feywild because a problem with the Feywild is, is anytime you travel there, when you come back, there is a risk that time will have passed differently on the material plane as passed in the Feywild. So you might have only been in the Feywild for a couple of days, but then when you come back to the material plane, years have passed. And of course, they don't want to risk that with the Apogee cells just being like, I don't know, 12 days away or something. This effect, however, can be alleviated potentially by a powerful Fey being. So Imogen casts sending to Morrigan to find out if she can help. Hello, Fate Stitcher. Here with Bernie Bear Cub Banana. <laughs> she wants to come visit desperately on a time crunch. Can you get us back without the wibble wobbles? Oh. Well, it's nice to hear you, whoever you are. Please tell my little bear, banana baby, to come visit. I can help. Always. I mean, Mari is a hag, right? Just like, no question. I mean, I, I didn't really have any doubts before with her being called the Fate Stitcher and everything, but just after now, all any small doubts are gone. Just 100% a hag, hashtag big hag energy. Fern is adorably excited about the possibility of everyone visiting her house. It was so cute. And I really hope that we do get to see that. I cannot wait to see the interactions between Fern and like a 10 foot huge hag. It's gonna, it's gonna be great. Everyone seems pretty sold on the Feywild idea, so I have a feeling that that is where we're going to end up. It makes me wonder if we're going to see you, Safayid, again, which was Erica Ishii's guest character in the show. I wonder if we're gonna see them again uh, if they do go to the Feywild. But before they can do anything, they need to head back to Eos to pick up Ashton. So Rin teleports them back to Ebenold's basement, but before they can leave... You hear an odd voice. One you never heard before, go. And you sure you heard them here? Smell them. Then find them. Ah! It's got to be adjudicators, right? It could not be anybody else. I bet Carol let slip where she took them. Uh, she probably didn't intentionally do it, given that they could probably blackmail her, but I have a feeling she let something slip. That's how the Judicators are on her trail, or perhaps they followed them. And now they're trapped in a basement with some super scary armored paladin thingers. How are they going to get out of it? Ah, I can't wait. I can't wait. Man, what an episode. If they had not impulsively jumped into that teleportation circle, this episode could have ended so differently. It's just, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad they're, they were just like, Yes, rush into it, rush into it. All right, please let me know all of your theories in the comments below. We just got so much lore. I can't wait to hear what you will think about it. I can't wait to see how this all shakes out. It's going to be very good. And to just get some concrete information about what's happening on Ruidus, I think that's very exciting. It's got to be so exciting too for Matt Mercer, who has clearly been sitting on a lot of these threads for a long time. It must be just so gratifying to see them paying off in the campaign. So yeah. Yay! I'd like to say a big thank you to my patrons and YouTube members and a special thank you to BRMB, Chad, Mark, Admiral, Gemini, Rob, Tony, and Yasha. And if you would like to support the channel, you can do so by heading to patreon.com forward slash blueboffin to get access to my Patreon-only podcast as well as behind-the-scenes stuff. And until next time, bye! Yes, I'm playing Walker Chetney. <laughs> <laughs> I used to ride, but not at this age. <laughs> <laughs> you have a plain walker? <laughs> it's just a plain old walker. <laughs>